The most valuable commodity on earth today is data. How we make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS Experience. Fantastic. Well, hey, look, let's uh, dive right in. Dan Scarborough, um, you know, when when I first started, um, when we first met a while ago, I didn't realize I was misspelling your name. And every time I would look it up, I would get a Paul Simon song, Scarborough Fair, in my ear. And so now, for some reason, every time I see you, I hum that song. So don't hold it against me. My apologies. It's a good song. Listen, that's all right. I've had a lot worse. (laughs) Um, so we're, uh, the audience is expecting you to bring it today. So don't be too knackered because you've got what, uh, you're like a unicorn in this space. You've got 22, 23 years of direct data center, whether it's staffing, hosting, uh, consulting and design and development. Uh, you're passionate about the current conversations around renewability and how do we really get there. Kind of a smart aleck um, in asking questions, which we love. So you're bringing all of that momentum with you for the next hour or so, right? Yeah, so I think I'm, um, I think I've been in a bit of a privileged position from this sector's perspective, because I, I talk to so many different types of people from so many different backgrounds everything from the application all the way through to the people that design and build the site, select sites, subsea fiber, you know, the whole end to end of this industry. So, right. you know, I, I, I'm definitely not working in my own little silo right. or in a big silo, depending on who you're talking to. Um, and I've, I've, I've also worked outside of the sector with kind of other industry segments that are you know building applications for 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 business purposes you know i did a little stint in the late 90s working directly with the united nations commission for sustainable development Mm. so i've been kind of aware of sustainable development since that point um and i've been you know passionate or tried to be passionate about you know, doing my part in the fight for, you know, preserving the planet for future generations. Mm-hmm. Um, I got a little bit waylaid for 20 years. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm now, you know, uh, you know, hopefully we're going to at least try and publicize some of the things that will help us, you know, help technology resolve some of the issues that some of the challenges that mankind have developed. So I think probably my my thesis or the thing that I, I, you know, that, that comes to me in, in moments like this, when I'm trying to articulate, you know, how I, how I see the world mm-hmm. is this concept of eco-centralism versus techno-centralism. So eco-centralism, and it's a term that I've known since a friend of mine told me about it, who did an environmental science degree back in the, uh, early 90s mm-hmm. uh, ecocentrism implies that you know the planet itself is going to heal itself and it's going to deal with any kind of a self-healing organism mm-hmm. if you like and then technocentrism uh, it infers that technology is going to compensate for any man-made environmental issues or any any issues that the planet faces um or that you know humanity face should we say mm-hmm. that technology is the salvation and always going to be able to provide a a solution to whatever that issue might be and you know i think mankind has proved very successful over the years of of you know leveraging technology to help improve the life of man on this planet do you know what i mean mm-hmm. uh, so i think we're at a pivotal point um as a species and you know we are you know we've lived for a we've evolved in a in a way that has you know has has led us through various different relationships with um 
different types of materials, predominantly carbon in, in the Industrial Revolution. And, and the reality is we wouldn't be here now if we hadn't have done that, right? right. If you hadn't have got the combustion engine and you hadn't have invented a car, etc., we wouldn't be in the position whereby, you know, we were as evolved as we are. And now, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, through the use of technology and the incredibly intelligent people that are out there in the world, we can leverage, you know, our ingenuity to deal with climate change um, and to, you know, preserve the planet in its current state um, for future generations. Are you busy texting someone there? No, I'm looking up a name of somebody that I want to um, I want to make sure I pronounce his name right, um, because you just reminded me of something when you're talking about carbon and this idea. It's a professor from MIT, and I didn't want to mess it up. So no, thanks, no, for, no, you're all right. thanks for I'm ratting me out because the camera was late for dinner, David. <laughs> <laughs> no, everything. Although y'all reminded me to make sure this thing's turned off. What's hilarious is my producer cuts this so that when you're talking, it's just you. So I thought, oh, nobody will see me. I'll just get this. <laughs> oh, that's right. I forgot that Dan was knackered today. So this is going to be one of those uh, uh, frenemy zinger ones. I love it. But yeah. Oh, no, listen, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to wake up quickly. So <laughs> well, I, I'll let you off lightly to start off with the call, to start the call off. Okay. But. Well, let me ask you this. So, uh, well, actually, first is a comment. I, 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 I'm when I say I'm late to the party, I've heard the conversation as it relates to our industry for a long time. Uh, I was in IT for almost a decade before I got into data centers <clears throat> in the uh, early 2000s. And it's only been for me personally, probably the last eight years, um, where I, I got much more engaged for a variety of reasons, got much more engaged. but. I guess my comment is, it seems to me like the earth will, you know, the earth has been here for billions of years, whatever the consequences we do, what I'm not certain of, and I think is along the lines of the sustainability and renewable conversation we have is whether human beings will. Like, in other words, I don't know that, you know, the earth itself will fall out of its orbit or whatever. Will it re remarkably change and unrecognizably change? Possibly, you know, there have been other events that if we don't um, use technology, I don't, think it, I don't think it's an impact to the planet itself. I think it's that's an what impact I mean. to our ability to live comfortably on the planet. Right. That's exactly what um, I mean. Yeah. <clears throat> and and there are and and I, again, there are people that would would state, and I've kind of listened to them all, and I've watched all the content that you know, we're going through a natural carbon cycle, right? Mm. Where the amount of carbon that we're emitting has been at significantly higher levels previously. And and there's this whole kind of, um, um, what's that, experience, experience theorist around climate change, mm. right? And, you know, I've, I've listened to it all and I've watched it all and I, you know, I'm quite open-minded. So mm. I'm open to both sides of any argument. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that I generally sit on one side of anything, mm -hmm. but I just feel that it's a big risk t to take. And I look at my kids and I look at babies walking around and I don't think that, I think it's our obligation to do right for future generations. Um, so, 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 you know, will, will, will it be the end of humanity as we, you know, if, if, if there is this, kind of doomsday that's due to happen on in seven years time when we reach this tipping point of carbon emissions into the planet you know probably not straight away um you know but it's certainly going to make life more uncomfortable than it needs to be and 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 if there's anything that we can do to you know to preserve our current existence or at least align our current existence with living in more of a of a, a sustainable manner, then that that would make sense, right? And yeah. I, I also think there's an economic benefit attached to it. I don't think that I'm not a, uh, you know, there has to be a commercial reason for us to, you know, transform our economies and our our society in a way that that makes sense to the planet. And that's why I think we're in exactly the place that we should be, because if we hadn't gone through the industrial revolution, if we hadn't gone through the technical revolution, if we hadn't, you know, gone through everything that we've gone through, we wouldn't be facing the problem that we're currently facing. Right. right. And all of that experience that we've gone through as a as a species allows us to, you know, 
deal with what's in front of us. It's just a question of, you know, how we deal with it, whether we can deal with it in the right time frame, and to what extent it potentially has a long term impact. Completely agree. I had a conversation not long ago with somebody where I said, you know, I'm not ashamed of what we've done. It was, you know, if you look at poverty around the world, if you look at in so many ways how um, these governments and these technologies have benefited human beings, they have, but we also now know there is at least a risk, whatever side you're on, there's at least a risk that continued um, use like this is going to um, impact to some degree, if not spectacularly, catastrophically, our planet. There's so much energy around, um, like how I use that word there, around funding green energy product, projects, about building out renewable. Why, if I'm a business um, owner and the economics are there, the technology investment is there, the private equity and the public funds are there, would I not want to pursue um, in every way, I think smartly in early, early days of running out, you know, we deployed green, uh, solutions that turns out, um, and I want to talk to you about e-waste later, had an e-waste impact because we really didn't know how to recycle them or how to mine and get the, the resources in. But nevertheless, we should be on this. I mean, we don't still dump kerosene in the river because we figured out that, um, it kills the environment. It kills the fish. It kills the yeah. fish. The river catches on fire. It gets into our aquifers. It kills human beings. And so we change that. Nobody can deny the benefits of kerosene and other fossil fuels in their day. But we learn over time, we've got to regulate these things. We've got to be responsible because this is the consequence to our environment, which is ultimately a consequence to us. So I, I'm I'm not surprised what people's motives are to, to join the conversation. What I am surprised are the people that refuse to have the conversation and look at whatever for whatever reason you want personal energy independence get in the discussion bring good compelling factual ideas to uh, contest so that we end up with the best ideas uh for human beings to flourish i think one of the things that i've 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 spent a lot of time looking into is kind of psychology and human psychology and human behavior, right? Mm. And if you think about how we've evolved as a species, probably, I don't know, a few hundred years ago, you know, the one, the things that we were, if you, if you go to the savannas of Africa and you look at animals in Africa, right, mm -hmm. they're pre preoccupied with, you know, uh, what they're going to eat, where they're going to sleep, having sex and making sure they don't get eaten, right? right? immediate gratification or immediate issues that face them right this moment yeah and up to a few hundred years ago humans were exactly the same it's only in the last few hundred years that we've been in a position whereby we can look at you know what's going to happen in a year's time what's going to happen in two years time what's going to happen in three years time and it's very difficult to align the way that we act as a species in terms of our consumption patterns our motivations our habits into more long-term thinking mm. right um and that's why you know what happened with covid i think was such a a shock to the world because you know I mean, I remember sitting here and reading about it and thinking, seeing it and going on in China. Oh, it's never going to happen in the UK. <laughs> it's never going to get to the UK. Do you know what I mean? I do. Everybody. A said couple that. of months later, <clears throat> um, we're locked down and we're no one's going anywhere and everyone's living online, right. right? And that speed of impact of something like that, you know, has you know hopefully kind of slightly altered the psyche of of the us as a planet to be able to see that, you know, we're not invincible. We're not, you know, we walk around as these mortal individuals that, you know, if, you know, life is precious, but very cheap and very easily gone, right. but we walk around feeling very immortal. Do you right. know what I mean? I do. And I, I think there's this psyche and the way the psyche works and the psychology of human <clears throat> behavior and then how we live you know, those two things are are slightly misaligned. And it's how do we get them aligned to, you know, have a have an ability to, you know, do what we need to do in the short term, but also prioritize more long term thinking. Well it's gotta be a balancing act because if the pendulum swings just a little bit the other way, you're like, why the heck do I get out of bed? Like I'm on a rock hurtling through space in this corner 
galaxy way out here on this part of the universe and if anything comes through and you know what wh why and then if your pendulum on the other side you're probably not going to last long because some lion's going to eat you or whatever like i'm you know there is no kryptonite i'm immortal i'm invincible um <clears throat> and until that impacts you in a significant way and so that's that's the trick is Man, I'm enthusiastic about life, but I, I'm, I'm skeptical of some things, but I'm not cynical. I'm also not a, uh, I liked what you said earlier, which is you like to keep an open mind where you get to hear many sides of an argument. And I, I have an 18, a 20, and 22-year-old daughters, and we're going through some interesting times in our house. One, it's interesting times, period, for that age. But two, we live in interesting times. And I keep trying to teach them the balance of, look, I want you to not because your parents believe something or whatever, have a, through reason um, a, a foundational belief system. Adopt it from your parents if you want or whatever, but have one that's challenged. But don't have such an open mind that you believe anything and everything. Believe it or not, the interwebs can misconstrue stuff. The telly can misconstrue stuff. Your friends' Facebook feeds can misconstrue stuff challenge it and make sure it reaches a high watermark but they're uh you know that's the that's the talent i think that comes with uh, maturity is figuring out how do i have an open enough mind that my ideas and premises can be challenged and if a right threshold of evidence overwhelms it then i'll change my mind or adjust my way of thinking and if it doesn't i've done my investigation and i'm and i'm more certain than ever in what i believe and that seems to be in short supply and I think I spoke to a good friend of mine a, a number of years ago, and, and we were talking about changing the world. And he, you know, he said to me, Dan, the world doesn't need changing, right? The world is the world. We live in it, right? So if you're going to try and change the world, you're going to be, you know, it's going to take you a while and you probably right. won't be successful. Right. Do you know what I mean? I do. And, and, and there is a certain amount of, you know, I, so there's a, there's a, a Carl Jung. I don't know whether you've read much Carl Jung, but he talks about this. Uh, he was a uh, the kind of what the, the 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 one of the grandfathers of modern psychology, mm. uh, and he talks about this thing called the collective consciousness, mm. right? Where we as a species share like a consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. So moral behavior. If you think about the moral. Uh, right and wrong mm -hmm. doesn't really matter where you're born and where you live mm -hmm. you know you know deep down that you know lying cheating stealing isn't a good thing to do and helping and caring and and is a better thing to do right right so so if you think about the, the this kind of concept of a, a global collective or a collective consciousness you know if we as a species had evolved naturally and we'd evolved through that hundreds of thousands of years, we probably wouldn't need this screen. You know, mm -hmm. I see a picture of you in my head and you'd be talking to me on kind of right. uh, through telepathy, right? right? And, and our brains would have evolved to be able to do what we can do uh, via technology. Now we've evolved this thing called the internet, right? right? Which is probably the most um, amazing creation of mankind right. that allows us to have a a collect a real collective consciousness on a global level across the planet that we can we've got our online personalities and our ability to interact on a global stage that's really only something that's happened in the last i don't know um 20 years maybe 25 right. years well, really, really, really since the smartphone. I mean, it was there, people downloaded stuff, and you might have watched stuff, but between social media coming online, 2008-ish, 2009, and the smartphone or, or whatever, this, you know, the device that makes us a cyborg, wherever we go, we've got the internet with us. Those combinations, I think, makes your, completes your yeah. point. The modern crack cocaine, right? The <laughs> human crack cocaine. That's right. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, you know, we are the consumers of it, right? right? So, you know, the things that we work in data centers and you know, applications and every, all of those things have been built for our benefit. Um, but I think we're, you know, we're still getting used to driving the car. Do you know what I mean? I do. We, we've only we've only been sat behind the wheel for 10 years. We haven't really got out of second third gear. We're not really sure what this thing can actually do. And I was having a, a conversation with um, 
a guy called Rob Aldridge this week who's just been appointed the head of the iMason Sustainability Committee, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And we were talking about, you know, with everything that technology can do, like Google, I can stick something in Google and it will produce the res results in like a millisecond right. of whatever I want. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so with all of the, the stuff that we as a species <clears throat> have developed, there isn't really a reason why we can't use that technology and that ability to manage the planet's energy consumption, right? right? To understand how much power we're consuming, how efficient we are consuming energy as a species, how much of that is renewable energy. You know, the, the, the algorithms and AI and what technology can do and enable, I think it's just a matter of time before we, you know, we've driven the car for longer than eight years mm -hmm. and you know, we understand, oh, it's electric windows. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The windows open. Right. This is a horn. The lights go on. And, and you know, we should hopefully be able to, you know, meet the deadlines that we need to meet that are becoming more pronounced to, to, to kind of manage this energy transition and manage this kind of this, you know, this move towards zero carbon, which is pretty difficult to be honest with you yeah um you know it's more of a, a label than an actuality i think um but no it's i'm i i'm an optimist and i think that the i think that the, there is a you know we're we're in a we're in a a good position at least we know at least we know the the race that we're in right right what we don't necessarily know is the route we're going to take to get there. Um, but things tend to happen. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Things tend to materialize and, and, and life has a funny, strange way of, 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 of positioning things in front of you when you need them. Do you right. know what I mean? I do. So I'm hoping that over the coming few years, as technology evolves and, you know, money moves towards kind of more green energy and more consumer pressure and more awareness of what we're doing, that the journey that we're on and the route that we're taking to get to where we hopefully need to get to will not seem like such a, 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 a far, such a distance to travel. Uh, once a, a business guy I worked with said, we have an idea of what paradise is. We just can't forget we need to eat on our way to paradise. And in the army, they have this thing, uh, the military, at least in the US, of command and control. And what they teach you is, this is the uh, Uniform Military Code of Justice. This is the Geneva Convention. Our mission is to do this. So with, between these two ethical points, there are times when they violate those, but between these two ethical points, navigate your way in the best way you can. You'll start off with a plan, like Mike Tyson says, everybody starts with a plan until they get punched in the face, right? You get, you start on your plan and you have to adjust on the way. But as long as you know what your target is and what your boundaries are around accomplishing the mission and taking care of the people, in this case, human beings, we'll navigate on the way and we'll go up and we'll come back and we'll go sideways. But that's the journey. I mean, if you think about, you just said earlier, look, I've been interested in this for over 20 years and probably 20 years ago, people just rolled your eyes. Today, the largest buyers on earth won't even talk to a data center operator, operator or an infrastructure person. If they not only have a green plan, but they have evidence and an ESG report and whatever that they are actually making meaningful impacts, at least in the States. I don't know how it is in Europe. So that's a significant difference over 20 years. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think I think the challenge is that um, it's bringing everyone along with you, isn't it? Right. Mm -hmm. So so it's a you know, if we think about we live on one planet and we all, you know, share this kind of world that spaceship. We're you know, the whole planet needs to get to that destination. You know, it can't be, you know, the the seven most, you know, the seven first countries that get there. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got to get over the line. And that's, I think, where the difference is, because you've got these geopolitical, social, economic kind of mismatches on a global basis. You know, why should we as Westerners benefit in the way that we've benefited from kind of the evolution of our countries? And, in places like Africa and India where they haven't gone through the same evolution, they shouldn't get the same benefit. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there's this, there's also this economic social mismatch, which needs to be navigated on this on along the way. Um, and that's, 
you know, I'm hoping that this uh, this COP21 event in November, um, you know, some of these issues are issues that our beloved leaders and, you know, the our elected officials on a global basis will come together with some form of unity to solve and, and kind of outline what 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 these issues are and how they're going to be dealt with. Well, I know you're an optimist. Do you have any reason of expectation on why you think that this meeting this time is going to foster that? Uh, we've been through a, you know, I mean, if I think back over the last few years, right, um, I can't remember the exact number, but I think it's not like 47 countries or X number of countries have made zero carbon commitments, mm-hmm. right? X number of companies have made these commitments, mm-hmm. you know, and that's happened in a relatively short period of time, mm-hmm. right? Uh, whether or not those countries that have made those commitments are on target to meet them is a, is a, is, is a different discussion. Mm-hmm. But the, again, the awareness, that global consciousness around this issue and this being an important issue and not only an important issue for, you know, the, the, the kind of economic prosperity, but, you know, everything, everything is underpinned by us being able to continue to exist in a, in a, a non um, anarchistic manner, mm-hmm. should we say. Do you know what I mean? I do. So, so, so I think there's a, I think there's, I think there, I think most governments and and countries are incentivized to to push in this direction. I think there's more and more investment and competition on, you know, how we can do it. You know, if you think about um, getting someone to the moon and the space race, you know, and the investment that went into getting um, a man on the moon, whether we ever got someone on the moon or not, there's another discussion. But that investment and that race, I think we've got that same economic investment and incentive in green technology, carbon capture. You know, there is there is that momentum that's kind of coming. um, And I'm hoping that this meeting will speed it up a bit. But let me ask you that. So you um, gosh, there's so many opportunities to take knackered Dan down a conspiracy path of two or three ways, but I let's save that for another time over a pint somewhere. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you know this, but my dad was a manager with IBM for 20 something years on the shuttle and another 12 on space station. And I used to enjoy, and, and now he's kind of, he's lost his mind with a bunch of different stuff, but talk to those engineers and those, everything from UFOs to have we or haven't we, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, perspective that they have and how they argue amongst themselves. But let me ask you this, you're t- using the space race as an analogy, there was only three or four countries really that were um, one in particular, or two in particular, the United States and the Soviet Union. And so if you look at the world today, those six or seven countries, you were saying earlier, I, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, that look, it can't just be this these six or seven, it has to be basically every country, but those six or seven countries generate, I don't have the, the numbers in front of me, aren't we 90% of the carbon, um, we generate the carbon, we make the steel, we make the IT infrastructure, we we do whatever, we we make the carbon or re, are releasing, our industries are releasing the carbon. How All kinds of countries in less developed or less uh, technology prevalent um, regions of the world they can sign up and they'll participate and they're enthusiastic and they agree, but they're going to make a, you know, a much a fraction of the impact. We need those six or seven. If those six or seven are on board, really the top four or five, America, China, India, I don't even know who would be fourth in a Russia. Um, don't you think if at least they're on board and they're all in, um, whether it's zero carbon or as close as we can get to it, well, continuing with human flourishing that's the right first step yeah i mean so so if i think about that kind of space race thing right um you know i think you can you can you can use the same analogy for the cloud right you've got aws you've got google you've got azure we're in a you've got alibaba you know baidu tencent you've got these organizations that 
are competing for market share. Right. They're very well invested. Companies that are, you know, 20 years old, they're the old ones, 20-year-old right. ones, right? Mm -hmm. With billion-dollar market caps, right. Tesla. All of, the, all of the, the capital and the competition to, you know, drive uh, us as a species forward in the right direction. And if you take that, that type of analogy, you know, I'm hoping that with, the, with that type of, 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 of capital available and intellect available, that we will come up with, you know, solutions that will, you know, deliver the, 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 um, the necessary environment, environmental savings that we, we, we need to make. Right? Yeah. Carbon capture has been, you know, it's, it, you know, even if we get to zero carbon or 100% renewable energy within a relative, within, a, within the right time period, again, my understanding is that we still need to develop effective carbon capture technology, right? Mm -hmm. And there are billions and billions of uh, millions and billions being invested in that type of technology around the world to try and make that commercially viable. And it's the, you know, it's the it's trying to balance the economics of it with the with the intellect and the time required to deliver it to make it happen. You know, the governments make a commitment, but you know. I think I think the problem with the commitments that are made, and you know, this is again being a more recent thought process, is people want to plan. People want to know how they're going to do it. People want to know what the incremental steps are to get there. Right. Mm -hmm. So governments, yes, they can make a commitment, but how are they going to do it? Do they really, when they make that commitment, when Microsoft or you know, the UK say we're going to be carbon negative by X date or carbon zero by Y date. Do they really have a, strat a plan and a strategy and an ability to do that with it at the time that they make the commitment? Or are they thinking, yeah, I'm going to lose five stone <laughs> by December? <clears throat> That's right. Uh, yeah. By, and, and uh, you know, it, that cracks me up. I just had uh, Eric. Do you know Eric Gertzman from Salesforce? Uh, I know Patrick. Okay. I know Pat. Well, Eric is, um, among other things, director of, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to get his title wrong, but sustainability, data center site planning, capacity, yeah, um, I think I've supply met chain. Eric. Eric's a really cool guy. Yeah. And when you were talking about, um, you know, these are these six or eight, maybe they can be expanded to 10 billion or trillion dollar market cap companies. One of the cool things that's running between most of them is this commitment to we want to see your plan to get to green power efficient operation and more and more a conversation um, I mentioned earlier that I want to get into around e-waste and recycling and managing because so much carbon is trapped in the infrastructure within you know we're I'm an owner operator uh, my company and industry but most of the carbon that's trapped in my data center is not in my roof or in my walls or whatever it's in the infrastructure that's within it anyway he said look this is a really big deal to us we're the if not the largest they're the largest crm i think they're the largest software um as a service platform but wherever they at certainly one of the largest and most influential and they just don't do business with people if they don't not only have a plan, but they have governance on the plan. They want to, I want to see the governance, not just what you say you're going to do. I'm going to lose five stone, by, five stone by Christmas, but what's the plan and how? who's measuring and checking you on your path to that plan? And I think that's how you can tell who's more, who's less lip service, trying to get a vote, trying to get through the quarter, and who's more... Um, I'm, I, I do have a long-term perspective. Here's my plan. Here are the people that are validating my plan, and they are you know, industry-recognized organizations, independent organizations to do that. So I, have you seen more of that willingness? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think you're on the money. I think, I think that's a whole industry that's developing and evolving, <clears throat> carbon accountability, right, and ability to measure and and um you know and authenticate or underwrite the the you know the the validity of the measurements that are being taken you've got things like edp to epd or ep i think it's either epd or edp certificates i think it's epd 
the five performance certificates that you can get on the you know what the the co2 equivalents are what the, the basically the material that you're using um and that's something that's happening and that's happening in the building industry if you if you want to build a building in norway at the minute you have to give a a climate commitment as part of that building that building mm -hmm. right um and you have to demonstrate all of the materials and everything that you get from those materials and they're pretty advanced um i just think i just think it's a it's 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 in its earlier stages and it's going to take a couple of years for all of those processes and all of that way of understanding and measuring and delivering what that commitment looks like to to to, to get to a, a state of maturity and that's partially dictated by you know the economics around it and 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 the accountability that you know companies need to make to their shareholders to their customers and being forced up to the government and being forced to be transparent and visible on on exactly what they're doing you know if you look at the cloud and you look at emissions and you take suddenly like scope three emissions right if i move to the cloud this is again my understanding right mm -hmm. so i should say that everything is my own opinion <laughs> no, mine too um, i'm with you and and I'm not great at numbers, and, and and sometimes I get my my letters back to front, right? It's part of my <laughs> dyslexia. So, I'm with if you. I'm, it's, please don't shoot me yeah. if you disagree with me. There's an if, asterisk next to what we're saying, but it's our opinion uh, as, and our understanding. But, but if you look at the cloud and you look at scope three emissions mm -hmm. and you look at the massive transition to the cloud, my understanding is the minute I, as a, an organisation, move my computing infrastructure to the cloud. That's no longer a scope one or a scope two emission. That becomes a scope three emission. And that cloud company is now responsible for my the carbon footprint of my applications and my computing workloads. Right. Mm. And I also understand that they're not they're not automatically um, delivering me as the customer, my embedded my carbon, the carbon intensity of my IT operations that are running on the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. Partially because they're they're not able to yet. It hasn't the systems and the reporting to be able to allow me to do that? It's not happening. It's not it's not available yet, right? It's just like when I, you know, when I, everything that I do, I can get my the number of steps that I make on my phone. I can get the number of calories that I consume from my food. I can get you know, the beating of my heart, the carbon intensity of activity is not yet at the same level of visibility, transparency and accuracy that other data is, mm -hmm. right? But I'm, I'm believe and I'm, I'm kind of predicting that that's going to change and that's going to change rapidly over the next few years. And there will be much more um, transparency and accuracy about what our specific carbon footprint is if you take the automobile industry right or the the automobile industry you know i can make a choice about what car i purchase right based on the embedded carbon attached to that car and i also know the operational carbon or carbon equivalents per kilometer that i'm driving right mm -hmm. and that's why there's such a big move towards uh, moving towards electric vehicles on the one hand and that's why there's such a big growth in these giga battery factories in places like, you know, Norway, where they've got renewable energy, because the car manufacturers are going to have to report on the embedded carbon in the batteries, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a two, I think it's a two gigawatt steel factory just being built in or just being agreed to, is it two gigawatt? Um, in Boden, in north of Sweden. And that's recycled steel or steel manufactured off the back of 100% hydropower, right? So all of a sudden, when I'm reporting on my steel, it's all come from hydropower, which means that the carbon intensity of that steel is significantly lower than in other locations. So as we start reporting and becoming a lot more accustomed to what the data looks like, the plan formulates itself. Um, but we're at the earlier stages of that. It's going to take another, you know, if you liken it to Moore's law, and how you know processing power kind of incre doubled every eighteen months, and you know the the 
uh, heat consumption or whatever it was done <clears> at the same time. Right. I think we're in that same type of cycle with this thing. I think in 12 months' time, it's going to be a very different world. In another 12 months' time, it's going to be a very different world because of the challenge that we're facing. I agree. One of the things you said in the beginning when you were describing the building in, uh, building material in Norway, it's not uh, s- similarly in California. If you want to build a, a new home, there is um, in most, if not all places, you need to build uh, solar with it. One of the conversations, though, that's come up with that is <clears throat> what happens then if I'm pricing some people out of a home because I've added this to it? And what I'm hoping that the conversation, at least when I have conversations, is look, back to kind of that, we've got to eat on the way to paradise. Some parts of the world, some parts of the U.S. lend themselves to, um, you know, the building materials here, I can make them in a very low carbon emitting way. But that part of the country over there, it's much harder to do it. And what some folks were trying to do is, well, then let's pack up this dirt and drive it four states over so we can use it over there to make our carbon. I'm like, how much energy or carbon did you release in doing all of that? Like, what's the overall, let's not, let's be common sense. It can't just be holy grail, one size fits all as we're developing, as we're learning. And the other is, uh, it feels like there's a lot of, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's, we have a tendency to attack each other in, um, this is also part of my conversation with some folks about, look, when we talk to data center operators, some of it's them- There's a blame culture. There's a blame culture. There's right? a blame culture. And, and instead of, and what I'm hoping they do more of, uh, my, my organization, thankfully, is pretty progressive. Our board's on board. We do publish an ESG. And I don't want, I don't want to make this conversation about that. But there are other operators that where they are on the grid, where they are in the world, today may be buying- Carbon credits is their first step. I don't want to crucify them because that's the first step. Some people are, you know, if that's the only step, if they don't create a plan and governance, and if they don't figure out how to way uh, a way to become more efficient and a commitment to it, well, now that's a different conversation. But let's just wherever we're at, some have uh, thermal energy available to them, or free cooling, or whatever. I mean, I think, I think, so. I think it's the, I think it's about the transfer of wealth, right? So, you know, the Brazil are chopping down the Amazon rainforest, right? Mm-hmm. And the world's in uproar because they're chopping down the rainforest. Um, and there's, a, you know, a football field a second or some ridiculous thing right. is chopped down. You know, so the rest of... So why are we not contributing to their economic requirements as a planet in order to balance that out? You know, we can't build an Amazon rainforest in London, Right. right. But we can contribute to or pay a tax, a carbon tax to them as a UK government for maintaining that rainforest, right? So then there's an economic exchange that needs to happen. It's just the same as, you know, developing countries. If they want to, you know, um, use um, diesel generators, and that's the cheapest way of generating power in their given circumstances, then how can we help them? How can we work as a, a one planet to be able to, you know, move in the right direction? And how, who coordinates that and how is that coordinated? And that's probably the problem. Who and how do you coordinate things when, you know, th- th- most things in the world, companies, countries, governments are their own entities, right? So who controls a company? Who's going to make a company make a decision? There's a there's a board, there's a committee, there's multiple interests, there's shareholders, there's mm-hmm. investors, there's staff. There's, there's employees, so many different there's customers. Um, aspects of that. Right. But then on the on the workload thing, on the on the on the IT side of things, you know, the, there are locations that are um, you know we we as a world are are living in a data driven society right we're consuming data and we are consuming it based on where we live and and what we do but there's no real kind of um delineation or or categorization of what that workload is how critical it is for what benefit and for whose benefit right there's no way of assessing a workload and uh, the economic, social, um, 
impact that that workload has on who's consuming it mm -hmm. right so so if you if you if you know if you look at places like norway as another bringing going back to norway you know they've got um a surplus of hydropower in norway a bit like canada montreal does mm -hmm. right um the latency from a network perspective you know according to the guys i've talked to they're within kind of 80 percent of all the workloads in europe right so how do we factor that into the future consumption patterns from a data perspective how do we make kind of workloads uh, based in locations that are you know um powered from lower kind of um amounts of of carbon intensive power um so that's one thing and then how do we how do we categorize a workload right <clears throat> is this really me taking a selfie of myself sticking it on instagram you know is that really something that you know is as mission critical as the hospital the life support machine in the hospital down the mm -hmm. road or the you know the federal income tax so the so, so I think there needs to be are. a bit more of a way of, of, of looking at it in a in a categorization manner, you know. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I, when you made that point, I was just saying uh, it depends on uh, what age you are, I suppose, on whether the 911 system, the, the emergency life support system is more important than your selfie. I think that changes with age. At 14, you have to think about it. Um, look, I... Here's what I here's what I'm curious about. Um, it's so funny. I have all these questions that I want to ask you. And we're we're going down this other path, which is much more fun. How do you persuade? Two couple things come to mind from all that you just said. As we figure out how, like, if we were a community, if we were a village there in in the UK where you're at, you have a pretty good opportunity to get together and say this benefits all of us. Sam, it benefits you. Dave, it benefits you. It benefits you, Dan. Here's how, Marsha, you're in, we're all in. Here's how we should treat each other. Here's our rules. We, we still are a little lumpy with that, but we've got this small little homogeneous world. The larger you get that um, world or expand it, the less uniformity. People have different pains. They have different uh, you know, goals, they have to, whether they're in the private sector, the public sector, pretty sure you guys uh, just went through Brexit, probably still in the middle of Brexit. Um, and so in the states, you know, we have a federal, but we also have a lot of power within our states. We can't even get along half the time with our neighbors. And uh, we're all in this country. So I'm, I'm curious, as you have these discussions with whether it's the private sector, or even people in the public sector, Back to your optimist perspective, how do you believe you're going to persuade people in the UK to pay a little bit more tax to help the people in the Amazon? Or for Americans, for example, we're going through two big things here recently with the colonial pipeline shutdown because data was interrupted, right? We had the ransomware attack and the whole eastern seaboard for several days. Uh, I heard one number again. Uh, this is what I understand. 40 to 50 percent of all the petrol stations here were completely out of gas and the rest had lines or whatever. Um, and then just recently we had a uh, the world's largest beef meat packing, um, certainly the largest in the States, um, is going through a ransomware and shut down. So if I'm shifting my workloads to countries outside of uh, you know, the boundaries of my country, what happens to data sovereignty? What happens if, uh, uh, you know, I've got a, a subsea cable, um, which there's much fewer of those than, than the terrestrial cable around my um, country? I mean, it just seems like it introduces, on the one hand, we get the benefit of more efficient management of data, but we introduce risk. How do you, how do you understand so that? You've got, so I think you've got, um, you know, if you look at if you take the uk government for instance right um so all governments are different whether they're you know kind of uh, communist 
or not the different types of governments around the world mm -hmm. and how things happen in those societies is slightly different right yeah the voter turnout versus you know number of people that vote versus people that don't vote if, if you look at the uk and you look at what's happened in the last year in the uk um uh, a stay at home order right I've been ordered to stay in my house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't travel abroad. Right. I can't go to the shops. Yeah. I've had restrictions placed on my um, human rights from a freedom perspective, like n I've never seen. Right. Right. And, and there was a collective, you know, willingness to undergo that, 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 you know, imposed behavior for the benefit of, um, you know the 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 society as a whole, and to prevent the spreading of the disease, etc. Right? Mm -hmm. That's a very significant behaviour change that's happened in a in a microcosm, right? That affected a global movement to resolve an issue. Cl climate change, no, it's not really any different to that, mm -hmm. right? The taxation and, and the economic impact of what's just happened in my taxes and how much money I'm going to have to pay and, you know, what that looks like and whether I'm paying one more penny in a pound or, you know, whatever that economic impact is, it's not directly translated back to that. It's just death and taxes, as they say, right? <laughs> there are two of the most kind of certainties in life. Right. As a, a good friend of mine would say. So I think I don't I don't think that we are, you know, I don't think that we we live in a socially contrived world. Right. We operate with rules that are, um, you know, delivered in order for the betterment and the safekeeping of society via our elected officials. And, you know, those decisions have to be made at a government level we've got the ability with business and with technology to kind of raise above that right we can operate internationally the internet you know if you look at taxation and the way international taxation works you know it doesn't take into it hasn't for a long period of time taken into account the movement of goods online and mm -hmm. electronically and this global society that we've got living from a data perspective and then you've got the fact that data is the it's the, the modern gold it's like a liquid gold right it's the modern currency um and it's a currency that's growing exponentially and it's a currency that you know hasn't yet been been really gone through that that maturity that global currencies have gone through right if you look at the global currency around the world there must be i don't know a thousand, two thousand different currencies, all with different values against each other, and that's developed over, you know, hundreds of years since we were swapping potatoes mm -hmm. with one another. Do you know what I mean? Data hasn't yet gone through that kind of that currency, that value, that that it hasn't really been valued in that way. And then that valuation of data tied to the underlying infrastructure, how it's delivered. How, what the availability is of that infrastructure, what the, what you know, how well it's optimized on what hardware it's optimized. It's just data at the minute. It's just a big pool of data that's growing, doubling every two years, right? So, so I think we've done a very good job over the last. The data center industry, I think, is amazing, by the way, and I think we've done a great job of of managing that data growth with 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 moderate growth in terms of global power consumption if you believe the facts mm -hmm. right or the purported facts that are published in the industry but that data is not going anywhere it's just growing and growing and growing and growing you know when was the last time you emptied your inbox or you know or got rid of files that you've had i mean i've got emails going back to 2008 <laughs> i'm probably never going to use them again do you so, know what i mean so why haven't you got rid of them I'm a data criminal, David. <laughs> right? We're I'm a data criminal because I haven't had the time to do it. I suppose it's probably the best <clears throat> way of looking at it. But that's no excuse. But that's then manifests itself with human behavior and what happens with human behavior. Well, you're do making two points for me. One is, actually, I think you're making your point and you're making my point. One is human behavior, even when you're as passionate as you are, 
with the facts that you have, is this just going to pile up? Until when? You get a notice from your provider that says, Dan, you now have to pay this much money for an inbox over that size. No, I don't. Then you get your first bill. Whoa. Whoa. And you can't operate your vehicle until this is resolved or whatever. You know, in America, it's student yeah, loan. But, I 100% get you. But I when get that you're happens, saying. you're going to be, you know, there is going to be riots and anger and what's the right amount and whatever. But eventually, it's going to settle on to we can't keep we can't yes we're developing glass storage yes we're developing 3d storage yes we're developing all these other things but there's only so much dirt we can only house so many things there's deduplication um you know somebody that file you're talking about you took a picture you shared the picture and you gave it to somebody else and now there's 700 version of the same picture instead of just one that everybody points to, right? So we're working on all of these things, but at some point you've got to get it. But when the behavior or when the cost to do it is too much, you will not do it. The second thing though is human nature being human nature, I, I'm, I'm not pessimistic. I just recognize it is, and you started off our conversation at the beginning of today with, Look, it's going to it's a journey. It's going to take a while. And we, why did we all give up our freedom last year with the pandemic? Because first we thought, ah, it's some disease somewhere else. Then, at least in the states, we saw it hit Italy and Spain. And it looked like people were dying and people were dying everywhere and we had no real understanding does this kill children? Does this kill like who's vulnerable? Everybody's vulnerable. Um and so we all stayed home. In the States, by the summer, agree or disagree, uh, depending upon which state you were in or whatever, people were now out. I remember the first month when we, if we had to go out, we washed all of our groceries. I remember lining them all up. We had the different, you know, this is where we washed them coming in. This is where we sanitize them coming in. Um, I think this is the first year in, you know, too many years where I didn't have a cold because we've sanitized everything that it came in. And then as time went on, we pressed back on, you know, as we got more information, um, who's vulnerable, who's not vulnerable, what personal steps can I take? People got more comfortable going back outside. And there was a lot of conversation, you're probably aware of it, at least in the states, because one state or even one metro area in a state their policies might be, not be the exact same as the other state. And so we kind of worked it out. But the reason why we all agreed, not just in the UK, but here in the beginning was we were afraid. We didn't know what was going to happen. And we saw this huge consequence. Well, and I think that's probably slightly the difference between America and the UK. Oh, it's just partially different because, you know, um, my, so my, my family's from America. My wife is <clears throat> American. Um, and the, there wasn't there wasn't because of the government and the way the government is structured in North America with the the federal and the state government there wasn't the same level of restrictions placed on America Pro America probably wouldn't have stood for it right there'd be a, a revolution in America <laughs> do you know what I mean I do but know what you mean in England they they you know it, it we became a dictatorship overnight right, right? and and I don't I don't, you know, police were arresting, you know, people that were out on the street. There was a, there was an incident where a, a, a young woman died um, quite violently in London and they had a vigil for her um, in a park in the city. And, you know, there's about 200 women vigiling for kind of women's rights and, mm -hmm. you know, making women be, feel more safe when they were going out. And police were arresting them right? Because they weren't allowed to have a gathering of more than X number of people. Mm -hmm. It's the world gone, you know, the, it's the world gone mad in a, right. in a, in a, in a way. Do you know what I mean? I do. And it, and it, and I think we, 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 what we're talking about is behavior and, and how you change behavior and how you, how you use the difference between a carrot and a stick, the cost of carbon, right? If the cost of carbon was, you know, 5,000 pounds a ton, yeah, instead of 50 pounds a ton or whatever it is, five pounds a ton, then people would be emitting less carbon because the economics of emitting the carbon would be 
um, worse than the money that you're making from the, the thing that you're doing, generating that those carbon emissions. So you have to get the right levers and triggers and balances in place to effectuate the right change. And, you know, I think we are, you know, that, that's a that's a struggle because, you know, the government wants to be reelected. You know, companies want people to buy stuff from them. You know, we live in these economic cycles, you know, these annual weekly if you paid weekly monthly you know christmas you know these right. different cycles that are not always aligned with that long-term um change that that maybe we need to do if we're going to avoid you know climate disaster and that's why this energy transition and this investment in green tech and the the fact that it's profitable why are we not doing it already right right if we can make money out of it and it's cheap to do. It's like Bitcoin or mining, right? right? Um, and there's a, a I do quite a lot of stuff of lots of conversations about Bitcoin and mining, right. and restrictions that are being placed on mining in China now uh, for, for very, which I'm, I'm pretty sure are down to the the uh, impact of mining on fossil fuels. Don't know for a certain, but I'm imagining it's got something to do with that. Um, but you know, mining as a way of monetizing power is a great way to underpin the energy transition, right? Mm. In terms of driving investment in renewable energy um, that we need in order to transition globally to a, a renewable grid. If you connect that kind of crypto mining into that renewable energy transition, all of a sudden you've got a a, a stronger economic model that underpins that infrastructure investment than you would do if it was simply based on the tariffs that you're going to receive fr from you know the the, the grid systems mm -hmm. do you know what i mean mm -hmm. so how, how do we how do we connect things in the right way <clears throat> to get to the right outcome well i i mean i think it's all those things one what do we think you know when when the when the Industrial Revolution hit in the late 1800s, one of the consequences that nobody really talks about, or at least I haven't heard them talk about, was the impact of child labor. Child labor exploded. Now, there had always been, at least in the States, you know, you had your children on your farm or in your local little mercantile, but there wasn't a massive exploitation of children until we had all these factories come up overnight, and we needed more workers and we exploited children we exploited women we got them in there there were um atrocities uh tragedies all these other things happened we created legislation to adjust um, and address those problems so and that still happens in other parts of the world but by and large in the west that's resolved we have child labor laws and all these other things and so while not an exact correlation I think the analogy fits in that as we're going through the changes and the explosion, whether it's data or whatever it is that we're going through, we're going to have to come back and clean things up behind us. And there may be an economic cost to not having, in this analogy, children you know, working for pennies where, a, where an adult would work for dollars. And the but because it's for the better good and governments impose those things. I, I for me, what I'm trying to encourage people to do, first come to this to your point earlier, there is so much opportunity. Why on earth would you not want to be part of the sustainability? Because at the end of the day, impact of the climate or not, at some point that resource is going to expire. The water I mean, we, we always have stress here in the States, I'm sure it's around the world on fresh usable water why are we pumping yeah. it through data centers primarily if that's what we have to do today fine but we should be working everything we can to reduce our impact in our local aquifers on, on our local citizens because it's in our best interests and and so but let's not crucify people on the way to that and i find that sometimes there's this true believer mentality um you know, you're here for all the wrong reasons. Who cares? Get them in. Get them on the bus and get us all working towards um, energy well, independence. Well, and that's why I think that, you know, I don't think that we're, I think we're exactly where we should be. I think the answer, the, the, the question that I'm, I'm more, that kind of doesn't keep me up at night because I try not to think about it when I'm going to sleep, but is, you know, can we get to where we need to get to in the time that we've got, mm -hmm. right? 
And, and you know, I think the impact is being felt on a global scale. You've just got to look at the fires in California and Australia and the changes in weather pattern and things that are happening. And, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, sometimes, and this is, again, an optimistic viewpoint, you know, if you're at sea and there's a storm, you've got to batten down the hatches and you've got to get through the storm, right? Right. And you've got to hope that the boat's not going to sink the, the the waves are going to get a bit less and at the end of it you're going to reach your destination do you mm-hmm. know what i mean mm-hmm. and i think we haven't yet reached the eye of the storm um but i'm hoping that with the continued awareness building and you know pressure from both industry and people and you know society in general that that we're going to get through the storm and we're going to get to the point where there are calm seas ahead with um you know that are solar powered wind powered and you know the waste is a not a thing of the past but is at least controlled i know you that's kind of my 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 um i like analogies right David. i, don't know you, <laughs> I live on them I live on them. Half the time they don't work and people just blink at me and they think, what does the tacos have to do with this? Um, so I've, I want to shift just a little bit to this conversation around e-waste. Do you have any conversations in your world around? Yeah, I do a lot of work with, so, I'm, I, so I, I don't know whether you know them, IT Renew and Ali Fenn. Oh yeah, I've heard her. She's a genius. Yeah, so Ali Fenn is amazing and IT Renew, I think, are doing a great job. And I've spent a lot of time speaking with her, and we've we've been doing a few things together. Um, and I think I think there are economics attached to it as well, right? And that, you know, when you look at the statistics that she shares on the you know the a the embedded carbon in hardware and what that looks like in terms of the 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 manufacturing phase of of creating IT. Mm-hmm. Um, and the amount of raw materials that are available to continue to allow us to um, to produce IT in the way that we're, we're producing it, those two things don't work. I mean, the, the comment that she's referenced a number of times is that, you know, we will have to move towards deep sea diving for minerals at some point in the near future to get the minerals that we need in order to produce IT systems and hardware, right? Which is bonkers, right? right. Um, and and the, the conversations that I've had with her and with others is, you know, it's about the economics, right? So if you look at ITAD, IT asset disposition, and how you recycle or repurpose things, you know, the cost of if the cost of recycling something is more expensive than the value of the material that you're recycling then the economics don't work Mm -hmm. you know and then there's not going to be an investment in that industry to improve the process of recycling to allow you to recycle those components because again it doesn't there's no commercial sense to it Mm -hmm. and i think we're at that stage again over the coming years where itad will accelerate and investment in ITAD, e-waste, and dealing with those types of things will accelerate and will allow us to hopefully uh, be more effective at reuse of materials and, and raw materials than we we currently are. I think there's also going to be need to be a bit more of a, a bit like the automobile industry that has got, um, you know, is able to calculate the embedded carbon of all of the component pieces used to produce a car right they can't do that with it with service at the minute right Mm. there isn't a you know because it's a it's as far as i'm aware and i'm again my opinions based on multiple different discussions reading stuff and thinking about things is my understanding is that they can't give an exact embedded carbon um of 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 hardware of all of the hardware out there it's not something that's required it's not something that that is reported against it's not something that um companies are obligated to do currently Mm. well one of the things i thought you were going this spot i know you've um you've heard her say this before she makes this fantastic point which is she's a big proponent of make 
the IT asset, a computer, whatever, in such a way, just like a well-made car, so that the first person who buys the vehicle uses it for whatever it is, three years, five years. If they use it for the whole 25 years of its life, that's fine, but they use it for three to five years. Then it goes back to the shop. It gets fully recertified, fully re-warrantied. All the wearable parts are easily replaced. They're replaced. And then it goes to the tier two market. And then somebody comes in and buys that $50,000 or $60,000 BMW for $32,000. And they get a wildly uh, safe, highly reliable vehicle or wh- whatever the vehicle is. And they use oh, no, it. I get the analogy. Yeah. And I, I, I 100% agree with you. I think that kind of second hand car market. Mm-hmm. And I spoke to her a lot about that. And I think the challenge that we've got in this sector is. Um, that you know the glasses guide i don't know whether you've got glasses guide over there Mm-mm. um so glasses guide in the uk i can put, put up glasses guide that will give me the exact price of any car any registration with any number of miles right, right? and and there's a pricing mechanism pricing system for cars right, right? there's also an ability for me to replace parts right. so i can buy a spark plug or i can buy a new steering wheel or i can buy the components of the car right yeah. we have something like the that challenge just with it name. hardware is beginning it's as much about beginning of life as it is end of life right right the it's not componentized in the same way it's not valued in the same way and i think that's something that you know is going to change over the coming months years you know i mean i've got this is going to really make you sick right now <laughs> right i've got look three old iphones I've got two iPads, <laughs> right? And this uh, this is a Generation X. This I've had for a number of years. And this is my daughter's and various different stuff. I've been trying to recycle this stuff. You yeah. know, they don't make it particularly easy to recycle. That's right. And then they're starting to use reuse a lot of the component pieces. But IT waste is horrific. It's a, a massive area of... of 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 concern and how how do you take something like this apart and reuse it you know what do you do you know how much energy does it take to take it apart and reuse it does it take less energy to take it apart and reuse it than it does to get the raw material you know there's that yeah no i look that's why i brought up the subject i mean it's spectacularly hard so for kind of working um from the beginning um, I don't think Ali's denying that her analogy with the car is that that's where we need to get to. We're not there. We, we need systems, that. right, that look that. like that so that you can do this. Because if we don't do it, it's impossible to evaluate and you get there is some recycling going on. But then to your last point, um, I've only done, I don't know, a couple months worth of research into this very cursory. I'm not an expert in the area of ease waste. But it's horrific what we see, and there's a number of organizations that now, whether they're ISO certified or R2 certified, there's a variety of certifications um, on board. But how we auction off our our phones, our tablets, our whatever, our LED monitors. We tried to recycle a couple old televisions about a year ago that got killed in a uh, lightning strike at our house. It was. It took me a week to find somebody in the greater Atlanta area that would take my stuff. I had to take it to them, and um, they said they had the certifications, but no big box store. It was. It was very difficult. It was easier to recycle kerosene or paint than it was my television. Okay, yeah, but I think it's the same with furniture in, in, over there. I think it's, it's tough to get furniture. Like you know my mother-in-law they were moving house and had you know a significant amount of pretty good furniture in fact they were going from two houses down to one house <clears throat> and they were trying to get someone to take the furniture and resell it or you know yeah it, it ended up doing a garage sale in the end because there isn't that we're not geared up to to win that circular economy that ability to to take life cycle assessment and to manage the life cycle of a product whether it's a server whatever it is 
we're just that's something that we need to evolve and develop uh and that that needs to mature significantly I agree. I, I'm curious to see where it goes. A, a lot of people are talking about e-waste. They're not talking it in in any amount uh, or to the same degree that they're talking about green energy buying, managing water, carbon emission. Um, but it is it is a pretty significant challenge with all of those IT assets and where they're going. Mostly we ship them off to third world countries and they're tearing apart that iPhone and they're destroying their aquifer and their health. And it's a, it's a global challenge. Well, I think part of the challenge that I see for this, the data center industry, um, is that, you know, there is a, there's, there, there has been and continues to be a huge focus on, um, renewable energy, right. Mm -hmm. And making sure that, uh, data centers and IT in general are consuming renewable energy, right? There doesn't seem to be as much focus given to life cycle assessment of the the IT hardware or the building itself. And there doesn't seem to be um, as much focus on, you know, the application and, you know, uh, bloatware or software bloating mm -hmm. and making sure that we've got efficient applications, optimized IT hardware. So that it, it seems to be a lot of focus on, actually, it's not our problem. It's the, I don't mean it in a, I'm being negative, but I don't mean it in a negative way. <laughs> it's not our problem, it's the grid, right. right? We can only consume what power we consume. Right. That's like um, cleaning the bathroom, but not cleaning the kitchen or, do you know what I mean? Yeah looking after the front garden and the people can see right and, and never mind the lawn in the back garden right well do you have teenagers i have got teenagers yeah yeah well we we're constantly battling our public bathroom in our house it's in pretty good shape because my half japanese half irish wife rules the roost their bathroom is an environmental hazard and I can't understand. And these are adult college going people. I, I presume I was the same way, uh, although I didn't go to college, I joined the army, but um, at least not till later in life when I went and got my degree, but they, I don't know. I, I just think that's human nature. You know, you've got the thing that everybody's gonna see. Uh, in your room, it's uh, reason. Well, no, we're not going to use. I was just bathroom. having a look behind <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe we. I mean, the books are more or less uh, organized. Yeah, I tidied it yesterday because I <laughs> I couldn't use a virtual background for a, a LinkedIn Live that I was doing, so I tidied it yesterday. Uh, uh, well, you know, it is what it is. But in, in the early days of pandemic, wow, it was uh, when people didn't Zoom didn't do virtual backgrounds or not well. I mean, we saw all kinds of stuff about people that. You know, they weren't able to put on the show that they do when they go into the office. You got to see part of their world, and uh, it was pretty funny. But look, I, I just think it's a conversation that doesn't happen to any degree um, around what are we doing? We're generating all this stuff. I loved your point earlier, which is how much energy does it take to recycle that? And then once we're doing it, what, you know, what are we getting? And let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. If it's a matter of um, maybe there's a cost we bear in the beginning, you know, we, we absorb the cost because we need to recycle, but it sh we should impose on new design. I mean, we, I tend to be a libertarian in my political perspective, and a libertarian friend of mine said, there you go, you know, how can you be a libertarian if you're trying to get the government to impose? Whoa, 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 whoa. I want the government involved in a small way, but I still want them involved. Who's going to do tariffs? Who's going to do right of way? Who's going to look out for the common? Um, I don't want this small group to dictate to that small group because they've got greater economic power. Unless you know, the only people who want that are the people in the small group. So, so I need the government to do these other things. But we've imposed on every industry there is regulation, inspection, adapting safety standards, etc. And I think this is a this is a looming challenge in the area of sustainability and health for the earth. It's not as sexy because it's not necessarily emitting carbon, but it is significantly consequential to human beings flourishing on the earth, the, the waste that gets down into uh, our living area. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the, the it's a it's partially bad design as well. Right? I mean, I, it never took off, but I remember a few years and years ago they invented a phone that had replacement, a bit like a Lego phone, where you could you take off the camera, stick a new camera on. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Take off the battery, stick a new battery on. Yeah, take off the screen, stick a new screen on. So it was a, this modular phone, a bit like we're building data centers in a right. in more of a modular way now. And then you look at what. Um, I don't know whether you've seen the Bill Gates series on Netflix. No, a, a little bit. Yeah, the first few, but not lately. Have you seen the toilet one where he had the challenge of, of kind of the, the toilet competition, right? They were trying to deal with kind of sanitation in Africa. And they were, you know, he re realized that a very small percentage of Africa had access to toilets, right? They were all, you know, using the, uh, all, all of the waste was going into the water. Mm -hmm. So they had a toilet making competition um, and they came up with very innovative toilets, right? I'll let you watch it, but multiple different types of toilets because modern day toilet is, is, has been invented based on the distribution of sewage right. from the toilet to the sewage plant, right? right. Um, and if you don't have that underlying infrastructure, you can't use the same toilets. So they've reinvented a toilet that works in Africa, multiple different types. And it's the same type of thing. How, you know, just because we're doing it now doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Just because it worked yesterday doesn't mean it's going to work today, tomorrow. Right. We have to be able and willing to have a flexible mindset and be able to innovate and change the way we've done things mm -hmm. and, and recognize that what got us here is not going to get us to where we need to get to. And we need to be flexible and fearless in our pursuit of what is best for now and for the future, as opposed to what was best for back then. And yeah. that's one of the things I think, you know, if, if, if you think about it would help in whatever endeavor you're in, right? Questioning how you do things now, why we're, you know, there's a conformity around society, right? That is, has been ingrained through multiple different generations. Oh, we did it that way. This is the way you do that. Yeah. Right. Why, why, why do we have to do it that way? Why can't we do it this way? Right. Right. And I think if people, if more people thought about life in that way, then we would move faster and, and be more nimble and entrepreneurial as a species in getting to where we need to get to. Well, I have a real life example of that. Uh, you probably have, if you have teenagers and you're being truthful, then you for sure have this because my daughters would constantly ask me, why are we doing it that way? Why we gotta do it that way? If it's adversarial and antagonistic, the answer was because I said so. <laughs> Very, uh, of which I got, well, of course, you know, patriarch society and they I was like well the patriarch society's ATM is about to stop working if you don't uh, go do your chores or whatever but <clears throat> when it was more conversational and certainly as they've you know they're now in college and, and we're having this conversation it's it's usually a lot more fun and I've had to change my mind change my mind on big things change my mind on small things and other times persuaded them to my way of thinking. That doesn't happen often, but I'm still holding out hope. But my experience is, if we're coming to this conversation, whatever it is about what we're doing today may not work for tomorrow, and here's why, we've got to persuade people not from a shake your fist or you're stupid or evil for not seeing this this way. Maybe it's about economics. Maybe it's about the future of their grandkids. Maybe it's about um, look, we're just not going to have that resource. If we want to stay in this industry, we need to do that. Or maybe we need to abandon this industry and move into something else. I, there's this really cool story about a tomato picker back in the 60s. And there's a lawsuit brought because one of the California universities helped to fund this tomato picker. And they said, look, you put, displaced all these people. It's on, you can go read it. There's a number of studies on it. And the lawsuit was eventually dismissed because what the court determined was, yes, you're right. That tomato picker displaced whatever it is, 100 workers. But where did it displace them to? It moved them up the chain into a higher paying job because now they've got so many tomatoes coming in that they need employees to sort and do the other things that the picker can't do 
um, that did more efficiently, more effectively. It drove the cost of tomatoes down in the store. It increased the number of staff that they had to hire. And um, it also, the growers refined the types of tomatoes because the farmer said, hey, look, I need a tomato that can withstand being picked by a machine. Um, and then it created a secondary market, which is boutique, organic, hand-picked tomatoes that are much softer, but they're much more expensive because we just got a few people out here. So all of this happened, but they had to demonstrate its um, validity through you know the data. And sometimes that just takes time. But when they got people on board to engage instead of attacking them, I think they made a lot more progress. Yeah, and I think I think we're on that journey, right? I think we're on that journey. I mean, you said something uh, that I, I definitely agree with. If you look at, you know, the next generation and kind of they their relationship with technology. I mean, even our generation compared to you know our parents' generation and relationship with technology. You know, the, we, the the world is changing generation by generation in the way that it it it. It's only done that for a few generations. Right. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and I think we just need to, we just need to focus on trying to be the best possible versions of ourselves, and try and have the best possible outlook on people that we live with, the planet that we live on, um, and and trying to do the best by it. And I think there's, I think that's the kind of sentiments that if we go into life in that way then things will you know move in the right direction mm. i hope so i'm an optimist in that way sometimes i'm disappointed but uh, i hope so i uh, just to kind of i i'd be remiss if i didn't ask you just a couple more questions and that is um it's amazing to me when i talk to people that are based out of europe how different some things are over there than here. For example, I've got data centers in Georgia. I've got them in California. I've got them in Texas. I've got them in, but they're all, we're all on, you know, in this wrapper. Whereas when I talk to my European friends, um, you know, I've got a data center in Dublin. I've got one in Amsterdam. I might have one in London or wherever. And there's a variety of a lot more obstacles that they have to work with. And the other thing than we do, and the other part of that is um, uh, the edge. What the edge means in America, I think, is much different than what the edge means in Europe. I'm curious, when you talk about the edge or moving out of the big four or five data center markets in Europe into smaller markets, How's that what, conversation go? What do you mean by wrapper? They're all in that wrapper. Well, in the states, you know, I've got a, I've got um, common law around, you know. Um, oh, they're all under the same, same legal, political. Very you know. similarly, right? They're, um, uh, we're all in, you know, the United States, pretty big. We're the third most populous country on earth. Last time I checked, and we've got this common. And so, while you've got the EU. To your point earlier, Czechoslovakia is much different than Germany, which is right. The infrastructure, the grid, the connectivity, yeah. the workforce. I think, so, so, so I think that I think that Europe is a, you know, I think that the market, the European data center industry is is pretty mature, um, and you know the Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam, Dublin, Paris. You know the operators that are in those markets and the operators that are in you know madrid berlin um you know they they they're building they're building good facilities um you know the capacity the demand and the capacity demand is 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 different depending on the location that you're in mm -hmm. and subject to you know w quite a lot of it's being driven by you know, growth in the hyperscale market where they're opening up availability zones, you know, what investments they're making in different in different regions. But I don't see the I don't see the data center industry in, in Europe massively different to um, America. Mm. You think about you need to be, you know, you've got PE register so you've got engineering registrations on a state by state basis mm -hmm. right you need to have a i think it's PE isn't it it's a, yeah. a, a PE registration in right. New York you can't practice in in California so there are there are differences in terms of 
that you need to adhere to different types of um, cultural language issues. Um, the ultimate engineer of how they're built and designed is relatively similar. You've got specialist contractors and companies in in country, but you've also got a traveling workforce of, you know, lots of, you know, contractors that are doing multiple projects across all of the different European European countries. Um, the cost of real estate's definitely different. Um, the competition is significant. I mean, the competition is is rife over here. Really? Um, the, the, there's challenges with the, we don't have as much space. Um, so there are definitely challenges of, from a real estate and a power perspective. Um, you know, the, 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 um, What's it called? The, 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 the data centers are becoming a lot better known, mm -hmm. and 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 the impact that they're having is a lot better known, right? So you know there are more. There was a moratorium in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. You know in Amsterdam they're worried about the water and what happens from a water perspective. They're just putting a, a moratorium on in Frankfurt mm -hmm. for the for, for from a power perspective. A moratorium in in Singapore. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's no power available in Slough in London. So that power availability, land availability, those are all key issues. The perception of data centers and the um, and the positive impact that they have on society, I think, is is better today than it was pre-COVID. We've evolved technologically. We've probably done 10 years evolution in a year. That's right. Um, given the way that we're now living life on this kind of way on an ongoing basis. But I, I, I think, I think it's, a, it's a highly competitive market with a mix of different operators, um, you know, some single market, some multi-market, some international, some US, some PE funded, some real estate investment trust funded, you know, some wholesale operators, some, you know, there's a mix, a mix match of, of, of the sector over here but generally speaking i don't see huge differences to to north america well um, here we've got people moving you know we've got what we call nfl cities but there's a lot of interest in the columbus ohio area in the hillsborough oregon area there are um most people know you know the massive data center markets in the u.s in in europe where are outside of the big five or even the seven that you mentioned, is there any particular markets, whether it's for sustainability issues or just growth of a market that you guys are seeing, hmm, a lot of people are talking about, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Scandinavia is, is stands as separate to lots of the other markets. Hmm. Scandinavia is more, from, is more country-based location than a city-based location. Right? Okay. Um, so, you know, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, you know, all have got preferential climates, relatively low power costs, and are generally greener. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things seem to be more city focused in other locations, but they're spilling into tier two cities like, you know, Frankfurt, Berlin is, is an upcoming uh, location where we're seeing quite a lot of activity. You know, Zurich, um is certainly a, a hot spot for activity at the minute um you know but there, there are there are there are re there you know eastern europe i think there's going to be a lot of activity in eastern europe mm -hmm. um places like kiev that have got large populations but not a huge amount of data center capacity everyone's trying to forecast and predict where the hyperscalers are going right everyone's trying to grab land assets and power and get them ready try and do a deal right right so someone i was talking to the other day um said that they had i don't know it was either half a gigawatt or a gigawatt of power requests in i think it might have been it was either paris or it was a major city right um and i think it was half a gigawatt so 500 megs of power requests in and around Paris from the grid, right? <laughs> for a hundred megawatts of data center capacity. So the market's all a bit kind of, you know, 
Yeah. And 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 I think the operate some of the operators, from what I understand, you know, they're how do they provision? How much what, are they? You know, people are building. You know, I think it's going to be an interesting couple of years because we're going to get to the end of this year. You know, lots of the capacity is going to be booked by the traditional customers, mm -hmm. and there's going to be some um, operators that are potentially going to be left with their pants down. Um, and it's going to be about how they're capitalized and what funding they've got and whether they've when got you, the capacity. What do you mean to, they're going to be caught with their pants down, that they built too much? Well, you know, if you look at the amount of, I mean, someone was saying to me that they've got 800 megawatts <clears throat> of development pipeline data centers in the UK. Mm-hmm. Right now, there is an 800 megawatts of capacity that's going to be coming to the UK over the next five years, two years, ten years, ten years. <laughs> yeah. So, but everyone who's got a land asset who thinks they can stick a data center on it, or is buying a land asset, is getting power, is do you know what I mean? There's yeah. this gold rush going on. Um, so I think, but I think it's a. I'm very grateful that I'm in the sector that I'm in. Right. And I'm gr very grateful that I've you know, got the experience I've got and I'm working with the companies I'm working with. Um, on the edge side of things, I think, um, you know, some of it's application driven, some of it's about, about you know, where the data is being generated, how it's being generated and what you, how you define the edge, right? right? Um, you know, it's not too long ago that an operator, an equivalent operator like QTS in operating in Europe might consider uh, Vienna as an edge market. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And they might have a couple of megawatts in Vienna or Manchester could be an edge market. Right. right. Or, you know, so so the definition of edge has changed and it's becoming a little bit more kind of these in the containerized and smaller, a container and smaller um, um, kind of located near mobile networks, located in cities that have got applications that warrant the requirements to be that close to the consumer. Um, you know, combining things like e-charging electric charging stations with compute requirements um i think the edge applications are not going anywhere and i'm seeing a lot of investment by large operators startups small operators and if i was to give you a number of the number of if i added up all the edge deployments that i've been told that are going to happen <laughs> you know there would be a data center of, there'd be a data center on every corner of every road yeah you know what i mean i do it reminds me of the early days of blockchain um, outside of cryptocurrency, and I was at an event that I was speaking at, and one of the scientists got up there and said, if we can't deploy 1%, we don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the power, we don't have the people to deploy 1% of the white papers of the companies like IBM and HP or whoever that are going to do something with blockchain that's changing the world. And they weren't anti-blockchain. This guy's very pro-blockchain. He's just saying that these projections and ideas is... You know, it's just not going to happen like that. We don't have the ability. And it also reminds me in the mid 90s, late 90s, where everybody ran out to put fiber in the ground. Fiber, fiber, fiber everywhere. We built out these massive fiber infrastructures only to have it all stop in 1999, 2000, 2001. And now we're lighting that dark fiber and using a lot of it. But there was that gold rush or that land rush that you talked about where we just everybody was going to become a trillionaire the next day because they ran all this fiber in the ground for, you know, gardentools.com, which never even existed. Yeah, <laughs> they all lost it. their, they all lost their shirt. But I, I guess to one of the questions, so here, if I set up a data center in Shreveport, Louisiana, I know, you know, your U S um, geography pretty well, not far from there, about an hour and a half to the West is Dallas Shreveport absolutely could use Dallas, for example, as its edge, but can a city in, can Vienna use Oslo 
or and I, just say the latency is zero. Can you go into another sovereign nation, even though you're in the EU? Can you go into that other nation and and have your data and your whatever there, or is it you know? I just don't have a good understanding of that. It's really not a big okay, deal. So, so GDPR is definitely driving capacity. Okay. Right? Um, GDPR is is definitely driving capacity. I mean, I, you know, the fact that I'm, I, I haven't looked at it for a while, and I'm not sure exactly, you know, what the legislation is from a <clears throat> European perspective, um, but I think that there is. And I and I, I think it's probably quite application specific. To be honest with you, I think I think depend. I think it probably depends on the workload, hmm. um, you know, and and the economics around that workload, right? So where the economic activity happens and the taxes associated with that economic activity, um, and I think and I think people are becoming a lot more, you know, focused on how they get their their their. A piece of the pie from these large organisations who are dealing with people's data, right? Mm-hmm. So I think taxation's changing and is developing. Um, I, I can't remember, but I'm, I'm pretty sure there have been, you know, claims or or kind of legal battles with, you know, our big friends about how much tax they pay in each given country. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so I think I think it's it's probably more tax related than GDPR related, mm. um, at, in, from a European perspective, or it's based on the application specific. Uh, but I think you've got to bear in mind that there are, you know, there are the 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 the, the, the types of the types of applications and workloads that you're seeing with things like um, what are they called desktop as a service for instance mm-hmm. right so you're looking at you know kind of gpu based applications mm-hmm. that are, have to be very close to the have to be very close to the the user mm-hmm. in order to not have the latency attached to that that things like that are driving quite a lot of this this kind of localized demand mm-hmm. um, and i think it comes back to understanding what those applications are and where they can be serviced from and what 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 the impact is um you know i don't know whether that answers your question it does i but i was sitting here amused because um <laughs> starting to feel guilty i've kept you on this call for almost two hours you look like you're on holiday in Spain without the enjoyment of Spain. I'm watching you get warm sitting there in your shorts and your T-shirt. I'm not letting you turn the fan on. And I, uh, I'm i like, I for sure owe him a pint or two. When I- David, you owe me a couple of pints. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you what, I've actually thoroughly enjoyed the conversation, and I hope it's been of value. And I, I know we haven't really gone into any of the things that I'm working on or, or doing. Well, we got a few minutes. Take uh, and we'll set it up for the next call. What's the one or two big ideas that you're most excited about? I, I think you. I think I think I'm done. Okay. Like, I think you've had it. <laughs> I think you've had it all from me. All right. You squeezed every last drop out. All right. Fair enough. Well, Dan, yeah. thank you for coming on the show, and I uh, I look forward to our next conversation. Thanks for being a good sport, and uh, we'll make sure in the link below that people can get to Rockscar and talk about uh, or check out your site and what you guys are up to. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Really enjoyed it. All Thanks right. So Have a good one. Take care. Bye bye.